Well, thank you, Don, for the introduction. Don warned me in advance that there were going to be math jokes in the introduction, and he told me that I had to laugh, which felt like a lot of pressure, actually, but you made it easy, so thank you. Um, thanks for having me. This is awesome. I feel like I, I don't know, I feel very happy. Um, I'm Daniel Biss. I'm state senator in the 9th District, which is Evanston and places like that. I'm running for governor. I'm going to try to keep this really like preposterously short, so you have a lot of time to ask me whatever questions Don thinks you ought to be asking me. Um, but we'll see how that goes. Um, I just wanted to quickly tell a little bit about sort of the story that brought me to this moment um, in my life and what I think this moment means for the state. And then just like a smidge of a tiny little bit of a word about stuff that I have had a chance to think about in the context of state government that might be of interest to folks in this room in particular. Um, but so Don is right, almost always. I was a math professor. Um, in the entire human history of math professors, nobody ever did that, planning to use it as a springboard for a political career. I was just like all the others, like that was my dream job. I never thought I would do anything else. I was, uh, I actually, when I moved into Hyde Park, I had this like very unpleasant moving experience with a U-Haul that broke down on the Skyway and a whole thing. And I'm not like a guy who fixes U-Hauls on the Skyway easily. And I remember moving in and being like, this is it, I'm never moving again, I'm never applying for another job, this is the only thing I'm ever gonna do in my life. And then six months later, we're off to war in Iraq and the country is spinning out of control, and there's this sense of um, our national integrity on the line, and then people are rising up in the streets to do something about it, and I just felt like that was what I had to do. And so I started to just you know, show up at meetings and like grab hold of clipboards and knock on doors, and through the course of doing that, just completely fell in love with this idea that people could come together in movements and change society. And Don actually very politely skipped a step of my um, professional narrative, which is that, so then I ran for state rep in 2008 in my capacity as a guy who was too dumb to know not to run for state rep, and I lost. And I lost, you know, like 51 and a half, 48 and a half, and woke up the day after the election, this unemployed idiot who had given up a promising career to do this, who's uh, who was married to someone who was just starting graduate school in history, who had a four and a half month old child. It was just all in all a giant bummer and I had no sense of what would be next. But I had, during the course of doing that work, become really committed to this vision of we're gonna do something in grassroots activism and public engagement. And so was able to bounce around and do a few different things and had another chance and then joined the legislature in 2011 and have been there now for I guess the better part of seven years and it's been really weird, and it's been fascinating, and I've learned a ton, and I've had really interesting successes and a variety of challenges, but in the last two and a half years, we've just watched the state burn down. We've just taken a giant torch to the state of Illinois, and the consequences for everything are almost unimaginable for schools and for higher education and for access to healthcare and for access to human services, to the basic fiscal condition of the state. All of these things were just utterly on fire for, for at least the two years and six days during the course of which the state didn't have a budget. And now the state has a budget and things are definitely less horrible. And that's kind of all you can say, that we've stopped, you know, having dug that terrible hole for a terribly long time, we just kind of stopped digging and took a nap. And we've stopped creating a situation where more human service agencies have to shut down. We've stopped creating a situation, for the most part, though, with even some crucial exceptions, where universities and community colleges have to lay off more people or where more students are denied access to, um, to tuition assistance. But we haven't really reversed much of that, and there's still this giant mountain of debt. And moreover, that only isn't only the consequence of two years of nightmare, it's also the consequence of decades of um, like, I don't know, what's a little less bad than a nightmare? Extremely bad dream? Maybe, how about like, you know, 
um, unsettling dream that stays with you for a couple of days because of the dark truths that it tells you about your past that you don't really feel like confronting. Is that the right? Okay, good. Um, and indeed that, that was sort of good actually now I think about it because in fact this is what we have. We have this broken system of politics in Illinois where most of us are just kind of locked out. As a result of that we have institutionally as a people we have very low expectations of our state government and those expectations are met every single day of the week and we've allowed the system to kind of persist and slide and so we have one of the most regressive tax codes of any state in the union more than almost any other state we overtax the middle class and the working poor because we're too scared to ask the rich to pay their share we have the most inequitable system of school funding of any state in the union the most a system of public uh, higher education that has become basically less and less accessible with every passing year, and a system of elections that's basically owned by big money. And all of that, by the way, was not a consequence of the bonfire of the Rauner era, but was simmering for a long time before. And so the question, in my opinion, in this moment of all moments is not only something that I as a Democrat am really interested in, which is how do you get more votes than Bruce Rauner and stop him from being governor. But it's also, and frankly almost equally importantly, how do you transform a system that got us here over the course of decades? And how do you build a political force that is adequate to withstand the incentives and institutions that put us where we have been for the last several decades? And that requires a movement of people like our state has never seen. And my opinion is we are now in a moment that we have the tools to build that movement because of the pain that people have undergone in the last several years because of the frustration that's built up over the course of decades and quite frankly because of Donald Trump and the awakening of activism that he has spurred. And we see it of course right now once again today Donald Trump took a completely insane, unacceptable, vicious, cruel, unnecessary action which is nightmarish beyond belief for on in the most direct way, 900,000 people, and then the millions of people in their families, and then the rest of us as a society in whose name this is being done, but also, and thank goodness, at least it's causing people to rise up and say, wait a second, we won't allow this to happen again. And that, I think, creates an opportunity to build a political power base in Illinois that can be a part of reversing the culture of machine politics that gave us what we have in Illinois. That's what brought me into this race for governor. Now. I want to just awkwardly transition. I'm not even going to say transition. I want to just like stop that paragraph and then we can all sort of, I don't know, um, sort of close your eyes and pretend you're stretching a sec for a second and then open them again and I'll start a different paragraph about what can we talk about together given the mission of this room in thinking about how we can make Illinois government better. And I, I think back to an experience that I had in, um, I think it was 2012. So in 2012, I was talking to a friend of mine who's sort of a economist who specializes in economic development in um, economically, uh, let's say economically disadvantaged communities. And so he asks himself the question of, what can we do to encourage investment in communities that lack adequate economic opportunity in many cases for decades. And obviously there's a really important and robust public sector answer to that question, but he focuses on the, are there pockets of our state, our city, our region, where the private sector just kind of looks and says, we don't really have opportunity, but if they looked more closely under the hood at the data, they would see there is opportunity. And so the answer is yes. And the question that that answer of yes brings up is, where, how do you find it? Where do you go? And the answer to that is, you have to understand on a very detailed neighborhood level, economic data. So who has that data? Well, the good news is the Illinois Department of Employment Security has that data because they have every, uh, they have basically quarterly data on every person who's working, on where they live, where they work, what their wages are, what their uh, job classification is, all of this data which is then published in massively aggregated formats like on the county level or whatever, which is not very useful if you're trying to do neighborhood level economic development inside the city of Chicago. 
So the question is, what could you do if you had this data? What, would, what patterns could you find? What could you discover? That it, which information you could then take to someone and say, hey, open a store that does this in this neighborhood. I know you don't think so, but trust me, we have the data that shows the workforce is there. We have the data that shows the buying power is there. And so I went to the Department of Employment Security and I said, help us release that data. And they said, well, but there's privacy considerations. And I said, awesome, yes, there are. And so what we need to do is study in detail the federal law around privacy and understand what kind of data needs to be suppressed and then build an app that allows a researcher to make a query and then analyzes whether producing, publishing the answer to that query is a privacy violation. If the answer is yes, then suppress the answer. And if the response is no, then publish the information. And then all of a sudden, you're going to have this incredibly rich data set that researchers can use to help in a concrete way right now encourage economic development in the neighborhoods in our state that most need it. And their response was, that's too hard, you're making me sad. And my response was, cool, you're making me sad too, so at least we're even. And then I made this catastrophic mistake, which was that I didn't realize at the time, but I learned, I'll, and you'll learn with me by the end of this story, that if you've ever committed like a really horrible crime, like the sort of crime that not only would ruin your own life, but would bring dishonor to your family for several generations of your descendants, and you felt it was utterly crucial to somehow hide this, the way you would go about bearing this fact is to create a task force of the Illinois General Assembly to study it and publish a report. And so, not knowing that at the time, I passed a, a law to create a task force to study this topic. And then I diligently, you should have seen me, it was so adorable, I worked so hard to populate the task force with all the right experts and I called them up and I visited them and I said, I know you think this is bureaucratic but it's gonna be great, we're gonna do this great experiment to help us get public sector data and use it to encourage private sector economic growth, it's gonna be amazing. And then when we were finished with the task force population challenge, which was no small feat, then you had to force the task force to meet. And let me tell you, there the brick walls began. And then after the meeting, you had to force the task force to build an agenda for the next meeting. And it just fell apart. It fell apart because the good faith volunteers who were supposed to be just helping because of their commitment to the project at some point got sick of the bureaucracy and walked away. And that was, of course, the goal of the people who were dragging their feet because they didn't want to do the work that the task force had it produced a proper report would have directed to happen. So that was sad. But shake it off and remember the project, which is a completely simple, uncomplicated, but really awesome project. And now think with me for a second about the extraordinary volume of individual and neighborhood level data that is housed in different pieces and components of our state government and the way in which if we had the tools to learn all the lessons that are currently contained in that data, we could actually better serve people. Think about, bless you, think about what we could do if we genuinely understood the interaction between Medicaid data and SNAP data and housing data and income data in a way that enabled us to not only understand what we were doing, but understand which populations we were underserving and where we need to devote more resources. Imagine what we could do if we, if we had the full picture, not only of this particular QCEW employment data that I've been talking about, but also with it of housing and education data. And think about what extraordinary power is there, and obviously people in this room have thought a lot about this and done a lot on the city level, but think about the remarkable untapped resources that exist on the state level if only we, you view the management of that data as an extraordinary opportunity rather than just like an annoying homework problem to hopefully convince someone else to stop bothering us to do. And so, I just wanted to tell that story, not because I have anything smart to say about it, obviously, but because there's like a lot of good stuff we could do. There's a lot of good that we are not currently doing because there's a kind of um, a, like a sort of inertia, like a sort of, 
uh, stuckness to state government, a, a, a kind of, we did it this way last year and now the state budget is worse because some jerk in the legislature doesn't know how to write sane tax policy. I'm not naming names. And so now we have fewer resources to do the same thing, and so all we can really try to do is do as much of it as possible with our smaller number of people and larger number of cases. And there's, there's not the kind of effort that we ought to have if we really believe in public institutions as a fundamental vehicle, a fundamental instrument to improve lives. There's not the kind of work being put into them to care for them and tend them and nurture them and then utilize them to their full potential. So we should do that. And that's all I have to say. Time for questions. Have you given thought about improving employment for people with disabilities? Yeah, thank you for that question. I've given a lot of thought to this question. I actually um, passed a law creating uh, an employment first policy for the state of Illinois, which is primarily for individuals with intellectual disabilities uh, who typically have been served either in institutional settings, which are well, in many cases are just simply not humane, frankly, or <clears throat> if not that, then served in, um, in community settings, either without the expectation or hope of employment or maybe employment in sheltered workshops as opposed to fully integrated employment. And so we passed a, a law uh, that I was the sponsor of creating an employment first policy, but that doesn't really do it. It just kind of puts in place the, the goal and then the kind of entity inside of state government to move us in that direction. And, and to be honest, there's still a lot of progress left to be done and still a lot of progress left to be made, particularly in the direction of real integration, right? Real integration, real pay equity, real equality in, in all, on all fronts. Um, when it comes to individuals with uh, physical disabilities, I think even less has been done, frankly. Um, and every time we fight a battle on this front, what happens is it's like a, it's like a moment of education that just completely takes um, the legislative process by surprise. Uh, and what that tells me is that there isn't really um, a culture in Springfield that says like, okay, we understand this community, we work with this community, we include this community, and then we build our institutions around the needs of everyone, including members of this community. Um, and that's like, ultimately that's an activism fight. And so this is a, a community that has remarkable activist groups um, as part of its movement. But I think we have to make that louder. I think we have to make that a lot clearer. I think we have to bring that to Springfield better. And I think we have to also bring it into the um, political process better, right? So like, if, if, if anyone, anyone here has run for office I will, will have experienced this with me and hopefully will agree here. Well, we'll see. It's, you can, you're all your own people. Um, <laughs> but when, in my experience, when you knock on doors and you're running for office, on every block or every two blocks, there's one family where there's a person with a disability uh, living there, and the question of how society needs to provide full equality and integration and adequate services, as well as equal employment opportunities for individuals with disabilities is top of mind in every voter in that household. And then for the rest of the block, no one's paying attention. And I think if you look at civil rights movements that have been uh, successful, they're movements that persuade every person, whether they are a member of the affected population or not, that that group's fight is all of our fight. And I think that we as society, if you look at how we've embraced, for example, the movement for LGBT equality or the movement for immigrant rights, there's a lot of people who are not themselves LGBT or not themselves immigrants or not themselves refugees who see the fight for LGBT equality and the fight for immigrant rights and the fight for refugee rights as their fights. 
there aren't enough people who are not people with disabilities who see the fights for rights for people with disabilities as their own fights. And I don't know how I can help make that transition, but I'd like to be a part of making that transition because that's going to be how we're ultimately going to win the kinds of transformations that will generate real inclusion and equality. Uh, so I, I want to uh, ask kind of about, um, you know, there's a difference between Chicago and the rest of Illinois. Um, and we're kind of in our own little bubble here, um, and people outside of the Chicagoland area are in a different place. Um, and I believe that the economy outside of the city of Chicago, as well as in Chicago, is not going to be what it ever was. Like, Factories in East St. Louis are never coming back, right? And you know, different things that are happening in you know Decatur, Illinois. Like this industry, we may not be able to rely on that coming back. Um, so, what's your vision for the future economy of places like Illinois? Because it's not just unique to our state, um, but how do we get people back in into the you know, economy? And what kind of investments do you see? Uh, you make it at the state level uh, yeah. to, to re-energize some of these places? Yeah, that's a, that's a really, really important question. And, and um, to, to be clear, I see this as a lo uh, you know, uh, 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 an evolution of the Illinois economy that existed on the scale of almost centuries, really. Right? If you think about what happened in Illinois, um, you know, let's say after the Civil War, you had this period of massive economic and population growth uh, fueled by two engines. One was the growth of the industrial economy, which you talked about, and one is the growth of the agricultural economy. And two things have happened. In the case of the industrial economy, exactly as you say, that has been hollowed out in a significant way. And so there are places, I mean, Galesburg is an, an important example of a place that really was anchored by a single, a single company, Maytag, and when it left, it just transformed the local economy overnight. And you know, when the Mitsubishi plant left, um, uh, in, in, the, in the area not too far from Bloomington Normal, that was also just economically transformative not long ago. So you've got that change, which is honestly mostly just unambiguously a, a problem, right? It, uh, as a variety of manufacturing and other industrial entities left either to low-wage states or to, um, to other countries, uh, typically that would go south of the border in, the, in North America or then eventually to the Far East. With the agricultural story, it's way more complicated in the sense that it's not as though we're having any agricultural difficulties, but because agricultural productivity is so great, there's way, way, way fewer people employed. And so for these two reasons, the historical sources of employment in rural Illinois, agriculture, and mid-sized towns in Illinois, industry, have both been on the rocks, really, in the case of, of, of industry, you know, now for like 50 years, really, 30, 40 at least. And so the question is, what do you do? Well, there's a few things. The first is that you have to make the foundational investments. You have to make the foundational investments. That means schools. That means early childhood education. It means higher education. And there's a vicious, vicious, vicious circle which could be reversed and turned into a virtuous circle, right? So there are towns in Illinois, Carbondale, Charleston, that are anchored by a public university that has been decimated by the state. Imagine if you decide to get that right instead of getting it wrong and invest properly in the university. So you do two things. One is you create more jobs, you bring in investment, you bring in more people who would come to become faculty and students, but then you also educate the local population. Right? So the, the kind of proper investments we ought to be making in education are crucial. We also just need to be directly investing in communities that, that have been the, the um, victims of generations of disinvestment, right? There are places where, you know, okay, first one manufacturing plant left, then a school closed down, then a not-for-profit closed, then a second school closed down, and that's been going on and on and on, and there's tons of potential there because there are people there, but the public sector's got to make the first move. It needs to make direct investments to put people to work, not with a theory, not with a training program, not with an idea, but a job. So that, that's the next thing. I think we also need to think about kind of where the future of the economy is. We need to make a dramatic energy transformation in the world, in the country, and in Illinois. And Illinois is poised to be a leader in the energy transformation. Why? Because we have this traditional industrial base together with 
an extremely high concentration of research and higher education entities, together, by the way, with a lot of wind and sun. Right? So you could position all that to make us an extraordinary employment hub for a new energy economy, and that requires some planning, some coordination of the various assets, and then some direct investment on the public level to make the first move, and you could be really, really transformative in that respect. I want to close, though, by saying that you're right. As a political matter, and we talk about this in our campaign all the time, the Chicago and the Chicago area are viewed as separate from the rest of Illinois. But know this, on many levels the problems are similar, on most levels the priorities of people are similar, and on every level the success of one is tied to the success of the other. It's the easiest damn thing in the whole world to go downstate and say it's Chicago's fault and go to the Chicago area and say it's downstate's fault. You never lose politically by doing that, but we all lose as a state if we slip into that because the underlying, and I'm not, this is not like a moral thing. I've got the morals too, but I'm being practical here. I'm being practical. It's bad for Chicago if downstate Illinois does not thrive. It is bad for downstate if Chicago does not thrive. On brass tax economic levels, it's bad, bad, bad. And so my job as a candidate for office is not only to resist the temptation to pit one region against the other, but to act in the exact opposite way and help go everywhere and in a difficult and challenging way educate people about how we all will be better off if we're willing to see ourselves as one people and design policies that enable us to all lift together. And know this, this is a little bit of a controversial thing to say, but Happy Tuesday. <laughs> the broken system that we have now is benefiting some people. It's not as though it's all losers. There are some winners. The richest people in the state don't pay their fair, in ta their fair share in taxes. The richest people in the state don't need a public school system. And on the rare occasions that they use a public school system, it's because they live in little enclaves where the schools are much better funded. The richest people in this state mostly don't use public higher education, and they like high tuition anyway because it means less competition for their kids. And so what we have now is a system where a few people have been benefiting, and they've been able to, among the most of us who are not, pit one group against another, and we all suffer. That's what we've got to change. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so my question has a similar theme. Um, so I guess another issue that I think at the state level doesn't get a lot of attention um, is gun violence and yeah. police reform in the city of Chicago, you know, often do this, you know, city mm -hmm. um, And last week, or I think it was last week, um, the Attorney General said that she was going to sue the city to try and enforce the police reforms that um, came out earlier in the year in the Department of Justice uh, report that are no longer um, being pursued on yeah. the federal changes. And so I'm just curious about you know whether you thought about how the state should be playing more of a role um, mm -hmm. in the city specifically. I mean, police and gun violence are separate, but often intertwined. And so, what are your thoughts on that? So just. Administratively, how long here do we have to talk about both gun violence and police reform? Because um, I, I, I think they're, I think it's a real shame if I don't at least say something about both answers. So let me let me just quickly, if you don't mind, try to answer both questions. Ar around gun violence, I, I'm going to start here, and like, sorry, but here we are. We didn't have a budget for two years. The state of Illinois didn't have a budget for two years. We shut down mental health clinics. We stopped doing substance abuse treatment. We got rid of housing services. We got rid of safe places for kids to go after school. If you believe in those services, if you actually believe there's a reason to provide those services in the first place, then you cannot possibly be surprised that when they are yanked out from under people's feet, bad things happen, including an increase in violence. Anybody who fails to make that connection is either lying to you or kidding themselves. So know that. A sane state budget, 
that properly funds the kind of human services that our communities need is an essential part of stemming the scourge of gun violence. That's number one. Number two, a little bit to your question, honestly, let's talk about investment. Let's talk about investment. Let's talk about creating jobs. Let's talk about the fact that there are, like I said, neighborhoods that have been the victims of generations of disinvestment, and the solution to disinvestment is investment. Investment. It's not a tax cut for a rich guy. It's not the creation of a training program. It's not even a better curriculum in school, though that wouldn't be a bad thing. It's investment. Put money back in the neighborhood to create jobs. By the way, in Illinois, government usually does that in the context of construction projects, in the context of a capital bill. And two things to say about that. Number one, we shouldn't limit it to that. You can create jobs by hiring teachers. You can create jobs by hiring people who work in the administration of government. State government spends a whole bunch of money all in. State government accounts for something like a tenth of our economy. Let's use that buying power to make sure we're creating jobs where jobs are needed. Now next, when it comes to infrastructure and capital investments in particular, what typically happens? Here's how it's gone historically. There'll be a capital bill, there'll be a project that'll be carefully placed in a community that is in need of jobs, that's a great thing, and then the people who work on that project will be from somewhere else. And the purpose of hiring someone from the neighborhood that is most in need of economic opportunity is completely not met. So let's make sure that when we do capital investments, when we do infrastructure bills with a job creation component, we have with teeth in a binding way in the legislation provisions to say not just where the projects will be, but where the people who work on the projects will come from and what communities the people who work on those projects will be a member of. Next, let's talk about gun legislation in particular. We passed out of the Senate this year, after literally decades of trying, a gun dealer licensing bill. A bill that says that we ought to have a state license for gun dealers. Why? Because we know that many of the guns used in crimes in Chicago were purchased in one of just a handful of suburban gun stores. But the state can't do anything about it, though we know exactly which stores those are. We ought to pass a law to create a license so the state can actually do something about that and stop that source of guns into the hands of people who are not allowed to have them in the first place and people who have been using guns to commit crimes. That bill hasn't passed the House, by the way, so we should work on that. I give that example because it's real, it's concrete, it's very moderate and sensible and common sense, but it would save lives. And I will tell you that in the, <laughs> I like to think of it as fairly short time that I've been in Springfield, the discourse on this issue has transformed. When I got there, there were just two sides and they were completely not communicating with each other and we never made any progress whatsoever. And though there's still a lot of that in the air, there has been some progress made, unfortunately, frankly, because of some of the tragedies that happened most, uh, I think most crucially, uh, Newtown. But we're starting to see some changes where sane, modest, but real common sense gun safety legislation can pass there's a lot of progress that can be made there. And so then finally that brings us to the question of policing. And you ask the question beautifully, because it is a little delicate, right? It's not, the question isn't about how the state police conduct themselves. Um, you know, they pull me over when they should, in my experience, and so forth. Um, the question is about the interaction between the state and municipal police. And so I think the Attorney General step is exactly the right thing to do, 100% the right thing to do. I think it was frankly appalling to see the city hide behind the Trump administration as an excuse not to do what they should have been doing in the first place. But I also think that there are reasonable ways to do more. I think there are ways to put in um, the kinds of training uh, requirements in state law that would help us assist local police departments to have forces that are fully trained in what community, what community policing really is. That's something that can be legislated, something that should be legislated better. We've had big fights, specifically just around disparate impacts. We've had big fights about legislation to mandate true, full reporting of um, all the data that would be needed to have a complete picture 
of the disparate treatment of different ethnic communities based, uh, um, by police. I mean, come on. That should be a very, very, very easy thing to mandate. I also think there's a certain amount of just leadership capacity here, right? For the state, whether it's a state government or a particular state leader to say, this is the city's job and so like, go ask somebody else, is a real abdication of a leadership responsibility. And if you think about the overwhelming need that we have to transform our thinking about policing, the governor should be talking directly about this. The governor should be talking clearly about this. You know, we've, had, we've talked about legislation around body cameras. There's, there's a variety of different kind of concrete steps that could be taken, and if they're paired with clear talk from an elected state leader about the right kind of interaction between communities and police, about racial justice, about the interaction between the policing system and our criminal justice system, and what it means to have true reform to our criminal justice system to go with a community policing approach, I think you could make a lot of progress in this area. And I just want to end by saying, I love your question, and I don't think you're going to disagree with my comment about your question, but know that it's not just Chicago. It's not just Chicago. I wish I could tell you that every other community in Illinois has perfect um, police community relations, has colorblind policing. There's progress to be made all over the state. All over the state. Two more. Okay, so you've been very patient there. Yep. Apologize if my question's a little bit of a I had to, but I'm narrowing it down to one question. You've spoken about employment a lot today. Mm -hmm. And I was going to ask, how can we expect Chicago, or Illinois' employment to improve if the employment gathering features aren't? For example, IDES, Illinois Job Link, et cetera, their websites are at least 15 years old. They have not been updated. If anyone in here is looking for a job, have any of you thought of using IDES? <laughs> when you go to a employment center, the computers are still two monitors. You're better off going to a library. How can we expect improvement if the tools for improvement aren't there? And what are your plans to give us the tools for? Improvement? Yeah, that's such a, such a good question. So in my first few years in the legislature, I was on appropriation committees, and we would go through budgets line by line. And you would be sitting there looking at a line, and you would, we wouldn't quite be in balance yet, and we'd have to find something else to reduce. And then there would be an agreement of like, what's that telecommunications budget there for? And then probably we would just cut it, but if we were really you know, lucky, someone would actually ask someone who knew. And that person would say, hey, listen, that telecommunications budget is there because there's an office in Chicago and an office in Springfield that are supposed to be working together, and last year you cut their travel budget, and so now they can't ever be in the same place, and they need this video conference link to be able to communicate properly. And then you would go back to the previous year and hear how their discussion went, and they would say, what is this travel line for? And then if you explain to them what that was about, it turned out that that was because the year before, there was a person who was the liaison between the two offices who went back and forth, but their position got cut. And part of that is because times were bad and we had a legislature that didn't have the guts to bring in adequate revenue by creating a fair tax system that would actually fund our government properly. Not, not, not funny. Sad, but not funny. Um, but part of that is because we were experiencing difficult times and there were challenges of how to cut budgets. And in every instance, in every single instance, the decision about how to cut budgets was Let's protect frontline services and go after the guts of government. And it's clear why that's politically popular. But if you hollow out the infrastructure of government year after year after year after year after year, this is what you get. You get websites that don't work for a modern world. You get technology that is simply irrelevant for a modern world. You've got an office that you're still paying for, but no one wants to go there because it's not equipped to navigate the modern world. We've got to be willing to believe in government. And if we believe in government, we have to invest in it in a way that can make it work. What we've done instead is that we've 
acted as though we don't believe in government at all. We've hollowed it out, we've defunded it, we've handcuffed it, and then we've acted really surprised when it doesn't work. And then once it's not working, why not just hollow it out some more? So my vision of a state government is a state government that actually does the stuff that we all know needs to get done. A state government that funds its internal operations properly so that it's run as well as any entity that you can imagine. A state government that has the kind of technology needed to actually be a useful cons um, a customer service entity because after all, in significant ways, a government is a customer service entity. All that stuff is expensive. But what does it do? It gives you a better quality of government. What does a better quality of government give you? A better economy and a place more people want to come to and more tax revenue. We have to be willing to make the investments needed to give us a government that functions properly. And I know it's popular to just say, no, 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 no. Government can't ever do anything useful. I'm just going to shred it some more. That's a recipe for failure, and that's just not what I'm going to be. I think we have time for one more. You've been super patient in the front. Um, at several points, you've mentioned the bu uh, bureaucracy and like forces of the status quo that have mm. been kind of keeping the system the way it is. Mm -hmm. So my question is, um, if you were elected governor, how would you go about actually confronting those forces and enacting your agenda? And are there any like role models of governors or mayors of the past that you might learn from? Yeah, I, th I think the the question really. I believe in democracy. I guess that's, that's where I would start. I, and it's not, when I said earlier that in Illinois we've had low expectations of state government for decades and those expectations have been met, like, that might be funny, but it's not snarky. It's, it's very sincere. And I believe that our democracy has produced the outcomes you would expect it to based on the discussions we have, based on the track record we've built before us, and based on how the campaigns work. So this campaign is going to be different. This campaign is going to include people in a real way. By the way, I mean, like I don't know if you all know this, but I'm not a billionaire or a millionaire, and none of my uncles or aunts have ever been president. I have, I have like one uncle for sure would be great, by the way, if you're looking for a candidate. Um, but like, I, I'm not going to win by that stuff. I'm not going to win by being the richest. I'm not going to win by being the famousest. Famousest being, by the way, not a word. <laughs> I'm going to win because we're going to do it together. I'm going to win because we're going to build a movement. I'm going to win because people across the state are going to rise up and say, dude, enough. We are going to stand together and demand a completely different form of government, governance and a better form of governance. And I think that's possible. And the great news is that if I'm right that it's possible, it will simultaneously build us a governing movement. It will build us a movement that can push the legislature. It will build us a movement that can interact with the institution of government. It will build us a movement that can change local elections. And that's very powerful. The dirty secret, the dirty secret about the Illinois General Assembly, I don't know, never mind. <laughs> One of the dirty secrets about the Illinois General Assembly if y'all want to invite me back, we can do an entire session on dirty secrets about the Illinois General Assembly. Don't worry about it. Here's a thing I'm going to tell you about the General Assembly in Illinois. People don't know who we are. People don't pay a lot of attention to us. People who, I mean, a lot of people in Illinois know who Dick Durbin and Tammy Duckworth are. A fair number of people in Illinois knew, know who their US representative is. Not that many people, if you were to stop them on the street corner and say, who's your state senator, would instantly know. And if I could just be very, very direct, that has meant that the Illinois General Assembly has gotten away with murder. Because the truth is they aren't really being watched that often. If we build the kind of campaign we're going to need to build to be successful and then use that same human infrastructure, not just to get me elected, because why stop there? But instead, to watch the legislature, to interact with the legislature, to push the legislature, that's going to be a thing the legislature is not used to. It will change the way the legislature acts. And so you asked me for a role model. When I think about a people's movement that elected a leader in Illinois, I look at Harold Washington. And I look at the amount of change he was able to make in the city of Chicago in the course of less than five years. That wasn't because he was awesome. 
it was because he was awesome and he was standing with a movement of people and they fought with him day after day after day. And it was hard and they had some setbacks, but they kept fighting because they knew what was at stake. That's what we're going to do here. Thank you very much.